the big news from Johnson & Johnson today about the effectiveness of their uh, single shot vaccine has caught everybody uh, with an upside. We want to invite into the stream uh, from Janssen Pharmaceutical, a subsidiary of J&J, which is producing the vaccine, Matai Maiman. He's global head of research and development at Janssen. And also Anjali Kamlani. She is the correspondent here at Yahoo Finance who covers COVID issues for us. Uh, Mr. Maiman, thank you for joining us. I want to ask you real quick. At this point, as, hypothetically, if J&J got emergency use authorization on Monday, how many doses are ready to be distributed at this moment across, say, the United States? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll begin with uh, just a thank you for having me on. It's such a pleasure. It's a great, great day for everybody, I think. Um, so our plan, though, we, we wouldn't be able to, to uh, have an emergency use on Monday. So what we would I get do it. Right it's now, a hypothetical, but how, how many doses? Because you've been producing um, at risk the, far, the the vaccine before the news today. We have. So our commitment is to give out 100 million doses in the United States by June. And I don't know the exact schedule of that, but it's important that we plan around what our timeline is. And it's likely towards the end of February that we would get emergency use authorization, and we'd uh, scale. Uh, rapidly from there. We've been producing, you're right, at risk for a long time. We have to learn to manufacture the vaccine itself and then uh, learn how to fill drug product and get capacity to, to fill drug product. And we've been working flat out to do exactly that as fast as humanly possible. So there will be lots of vaccine at the time that we'll, we'll have an emergency use authorization. Matai Anjali here. Uh, looking at the vaccine efficacy, of course, broadly 66% uh, in the U.S., 72%. But then looking at it from the protection standpoint of severe disease protection at 85 and hospitalizations 100, some people are pointing out that severe usually ends up as a hospitalization. So can you rectify that difference? Sure. I think uh, it's a, such a great question because these are protocol, very formal definitions, and sometimes they depart a little bit from how people use the, the words. So severe COVID in our definition were those people that suffered multiple symptoms, um, and but to the point where they weren't necessarily seeking medical attention, but they felt quite ill and remained at home uh, all the way through being in the hospital, the ICU, mechanically ventilated, and, uh, and unfortunately some would pass away. So what we do is we collect that broad category of severe disease, and we say we're 85% protective against uh, severe disease. And that, by the way, and this is probably one of the most important points of our data set, is also true in South Africa. 85% effective in preventing severe disease in South Africa, where more than 90% of the strains are this problematic B1351. Uh, so, and then if we pick the subset that is just around those that needed to have medical interventions, like go to the hospital and all the things that could happen to you in a hospital or die, all of those uh, subjects that had hospitalization or death were on placebo. Zero of them had, had vaccine. I mean, Ty, when, it, when we talk about the virus evolving in these new strains out of South Africa, out of the UK, and out of Brazil, I mean, it really points to the fact that what we're seeing take place is these new strains are more contagious. I guess, how are you thinking about that? And how, and how are you preparing for more mutations to take place when you're developing this vaccine and maybe future booster shots if needed? It's a really good question. Like all these variants, the entire panoply of variants seem to have evolved in the last month or two in a major way where they've taken hold. And that may be because of the selective pressure of individuals having uh, having had COVID, and now the virus is under some selective pressure to evolve itself to replicate even in them. And so that's that's likely what's going on. The fastest way to respond is to give a vaccine that protects against substantial disease, severe disease, um, even with those variants. So that's why we're so excited about our data, because it does protect against uh, having significant illness with COVID, even with these variants. You're asking though a really good question, like what about what's next? The best way to deal with this is vaccinate everyone as quickly as possible. It reduces the number of viral replications in the world and radically therefore reduces the chance of a variant popping up. 
Matai, looking at the uh, the production question again, uh, you know, looking forward um, within the first week after the EUA or even the first day, do you have any numbers right now to set what is going out the door? And then after that, what are the obstacles that you might be hitting to ramp up? I know there have already been uh, discussions or reports about some manufacturing hurdles. So we don't have, uh, we haven't had anything happen that was uh, unplanned for. We've been working really hard for the last six or nine months to learn how to manufacture this vaccine, and we are producing vaccine. Uh, I can't give you an exact schedule over days and weeks. Uh, it depends on when exactly that emergency use authorization comes in, but we do have vaccine, and we have a commitment from the United States government who purchased 100 million doses for June to do exactly that. It's not not all going to show up in June. There's a schedule. I just don't know it uh, right now. It depends a little bit about when that EUA comes through. You know, and, and when we introduced you, we pointed out that you are the head, the global head of R&D at Janssen. But I also want to point out to the people watching, you are a PhD in chemistry, which is where this next question comes from. Is Are we going to get to a point with COVID-19 where it's kind of like the seasonal flu? We'll get that inoculation every year and it'll, for most people, be just a, a once a year. Maybe you get the flu, you're home for a couple of days and that's it. I think so. I think this virus does not mutate uh, as frequently as the flu. So the frequency of a shot depends on uh, two things. One is how durable your immune response is, and we're feeling really good about that with our vaccine. And second, how quickly the virus changes. Here, the virus doesn't change nearly as quickly as influenza. So if we do, in fact, get to a high level of protection and the immune response is really durable, Maybe it's every year, two years, three years. If it's really like shut down, then maybe it's less frequent than that. If the population is only partially uh, inoc vaccinated and the virus is allowed to replicate and more mutations show up, then you might have to have an annual shot. So it depends a little bit on how things play out over the next uh, half year, most likely. We appreciate the update. I think a lot of us are very eager to get a vaccine as soon as we can and are pleased with the results. Uh, Matai Maiman, Global Head of Research and Development for Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. Thank you for joining us here on Yahoo Finance Live. Much appreciated. Thank you.